is July 22nd, 2021. My name is Connor Thomas Reed. I'm here with Sean Malloy and with Paul oh, and Denise Adam Sims. Um, so, Paul, thank you so much for connecting with us. Paul and Denise connecting with us today. I'm 72 years old. And that um, point in which um, in, in New York City, um, I, uh, I wasn't involved with the paper between 1965 mm -hmm. and, and 1970. And I'm, I'm here now in, in San Diego with my, with my lovely wife, Denise Sam. How long have you guys been together now? 40 years. This year, May 9th, uh, 40 years we've been married. Much respect. Congratulations. Thank you. I grew up in New York City, just outside Bed-Stuy, and then moved to St. Albans, probably 54. Went to um, Andrew Jackson High School. I went to Andrew Jackson High School. It was a large school. A school with, had probably 5,000 students. Classes were tracked then. And I found myself in a track with students who all appeared to be headed towards college. And then from there to CCMI, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then on um, from there to UCSD Medical Center, and then then ultimately got my uh, yes. master's in public health from the university. Of Michigan. I'm curious, what was the City College of New York like when you started there, when you arrived on campus? Uh, what were the classrooms like? How were the interactions between the students and the faculty? What was the relationship between the college and uh, the neighborhood of Harlem? It, it, it was like two different campuses, mm -hmm. one up and one down. That is to say, um, there was a, uh, a, an idea that we would be up on the hill and the people would be down in the valley. I had the good fortune of getting to CCNY and being a student there for four or five years. And CCNY was, was, was a... Uh, it was a pretty top five school. I mean, I, I uh, for institutions in the country, it, it 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 ranked, you know, in the top five or ten percent, I suspect. Well, I was I, I started out as a as a as a pre med major. I was probably taking four or five classes, and and um, some I did well, some I didn't do well. Biology was good. I, I had a particular interest in uh, in genetics. I wound up uh, in, the, in the genetics research project for two and a half or three years, doing uh, regeneration of limbs in mice through uh, corticoid injections and electrical stimulation. What, what I try to do is after a, a year at City College, I essentially became a, a copy editor. And then from copy editor to the editor in chief. So the, so the notion of, the notion of, uh, maneuver through the system i actually i actually wound up with two two different organizational sites 
One was Tech News that ultimately became the paper. And the second was uh, BSSO, Black Science Students Organization, which ultimately became National Black Science Students Organization. How did you get involved with the Tech News? There was a fellow who I, I met on campus, Tom Chase, I think his name was. He was involved in tech news. I think he was a more a photographer, but but he was uh, a humanist. And I don't know how we interacted, but I was I took a liking to him, and he took a liking to me, and so he he invited me to come to tech news, and one thing led to another, and. I thought this was an opportunity to uh, to communicate with people, you know. I can't tell you the amount of distance I felt from the tech news staff when I joined it in 66 or 67, whenever that was. And 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 I and I figured out that part of that problem was some preconceived notion that related to me. What were some of your journalism inspirations and also social movement inspirations at the time? What inspired your writing? Um, I, I, I like to write. Mm -hmm. I thought writing was very important. I, I thought that through efforts, we could be able to share what was down in the community by, by going up. And, and so um, I, I, I did what I could do to try to add to the party politics. My mentor was a man whose name is John L.S. Holloman, H-O-L-L-O-M-A-N. MD. He had offices in Harlem, I think 135th Street. But he also became the first African American uh, commissioner of the Health and Hospital Corporation. And I don't know how I met him, but I know that we kind of took to each other pretty instantly. And what would happen is during the course of the week, on Thursday, I would always come come in late because I would stop by and pick him up dinner and take him to dinner. And in exchange for the dinner, he would explain stuff to me. You know, at one point, Holloman challenged the AMA's certification of hospitals in the South, which allowed black physicians to be excluded, but. By, by race, by technique, you know, if they, you know, if you can't, if you can't have two other physicians promote your um, status to be on the medical staff, then you couldn't join the medical staff. And at the same time, Holloman crafted a set of social values for me um, that I, I I continue to have. So we found that uh, you were writing articles about a development plan for St. Nicholas Park in 1966. You were writing about the 1968 uh, um, teacher strike and uh, all of these alternative uh, schools that popped up in Harlem uh, to support children. Um, and um, so would you share a little bit more about uh, you writing about issues in Harlem for uh, for science and engineering readers at City College? Over the course of a year, our efforts grew very heavily on understanding how people essentially engineered a shift mm -hmm. from where they are to where they want to be. The university sat in the, on the edge of Harlem, and it, 
didn't know anything about Harlem. People would come to class every day, and 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 if they were going downhill, they were headed for the subway. And if 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 I was going to do something, my goal was to try to get them to look up and and just see what's going on out here, you know, just to 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 look at. At, at this as something that we ought to try to at least do something about. So the, the, the notion over the course of a year is that we can um, ultimately try to be one by establishing differences between who people are and who people wanted to be. You have this uh, really powerful interview series where you interviewed uh, across 1967, several uh, prominent black leaders, Dan, Dan Watts of Liberator Magazine, Floyd McKissick of the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, Minister Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam, William Wright, who was part of an organization of uh, Afro-American uh, struggle, and the comedian Dick Gregory. And I'm curious, uh, in interviewing these different leaders, uh, Dan Watts, Dick Gregory, Louis Farrakhan, do you remember, did you invite them onto campus to do these interviews, or would you go to their offices or their homes in Harlem or in New York City? Uh, in, in most cases, we, we went to the community. Mm -hmm. We specifically went to people like Louis Farrakhan and, and Daniel Weber to talk about how best can shape the community from the community's interests. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that was good because we also got to get out and, and see the world from the perspective of what happened in the community with regards to how community can change the world from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we, what we tried to do was to bring a reality by bringing people to the fore who, who, who understood the difference between the, the true and the trick. Um, we were lucky enough to develop a friendship with Dick Gregory. Um, he remembered Paul from the interview and mm -hmm. we were able to, and when he came out here, we were able to meet with him and spend some time with him. So over the years, we've seen him, we saw him a couple of times. You, uh, in tech news, would print these op-eds where you would basically lay out a blueprint for what a Black Studies department could look like at City College. Uh, were you uh, modeling these suggestions um, under kind of pre-existing senses about what study should be, what curriculum, or uh, um, having a major on a certain discipline could look like? I, I look at those tools from the perspective of how around the, the world, mm -hmm. we, we can um, design campus so that um, CCNY could, could become a history of, of, of people's change and people's understanding of how, how we can see them do better. We specifically looked at Howard mm -hmm. and, and Meharry and at Atlanta University from, from the perspective of, of how to best um, translate those programs and into ones that work at City College of New York. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hearing you talk about making a bridge between the community of Harlem and City College. 
and also making a bridge between the programs at Howard University or in Atlanta, the mm -hmm. historically black colleges, and then trying to bring those black studies to City College. Right, and, and to, to the extent that, that we can, we are sure that in the end, uh, people to both the inside out mm -hmm. and the outside in. You told us when we spoke um, informally that you also were an activist in college. Can you can you tell us about your college experience? Um, Paul was a few years ahead of me. So, but in 1970, I went to Elmhurst College, mm -hmm. and at that point, they were trying to the, some of the black students there were trying to organize a black studies department to get black studies started at Elmhurst, which is a very it's a private liberal arts school, probably a total of 3,000 students. Washington, D.C. at that time was probably 76% Black, and my coming to Elmhurst was a very eye-opening experience for me. Mm -hmm. Very different. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was very different. Mm -hmm. But I always tell young people when they go off to school, focus on your studies. Um, and don't get too angry because that's really what was detrimental to me, trying to deal with the anger and the frustration that I felt in not getting some of my needs met through the university um, and how you temper that to be able to study and to focus so that you can get out of there and go ahead and do what you need to do Mm -hmm. to to make it a better place and not not let them sidetrack you. In Illinois, in Elmhurst, every time four or five black students would go into the into town, they would follow us around, you know, just kind of to see if we were going to steal anything or or we used to run at night. And so we would run into the Baskin and Robbins to get ice cream and they saw these four Black people running through Elmhurst at night on their way to the Baskin Rum. And the police car followed us for a while to, to wow. see where we were going. And Elmhurst wasn't giving us something. And so we realized that and we began to ask for meetings with the administration and, you know, tried to get things going. And they just didn't seem to want to hear us. We just started talking and we formed a, what we call Block, Black Leadership Organized and Consolidated. Um, we had senators, state senators' daughters. We had Frederick Douglass Sinstack's grandson, um, uh, Elijah Muhammad's grandson went to Elmhurst. You know, you go to a sociology class and you come away. I think I spent a lot of time being angry, being frustrated that they were talking about things that just didn't seem to apply to us or mm. were very one-sided. And, um, and when they, in one class in particular, I remember the instructor asked one of the other African-American females, well, what was it like living in a ghetto? And I remember her saying to him, my mother is a physician, my father is a, an attorney, and I wouldn't know a ghetto if it smacked me in the face. So somehow the idea came up to take over the president's office. Mm -hmm. So we sat in and we just stayed there um, for about 24 hours before they had the police just remove us. But we, we put together a delegation and they, they actually worked to develop the Black Studies Department. We worked, we had classes in ethnomusicology and black history and so on. And it was, um, it was a good experience. But I think more than anything, we had what people might have called radicals at that point on campus. Having um, Frederick Douglass Sinstack on campus and him carrying the legacy of his great grandfather, he was just determined that we should have more on that campus. And um, one of our persons who later became our instructor was an attorney in Chicago, 
and he was very much involved with helping us look at Black history as they had done in the sit Chicago City College. Mm -hmm. We spent our Saturdays in Chicago at Operation Breadbasket with Jesse Jackson when they were first getting started. So the, the, we got the energy and the impetus from, from a lot of the people in the city who said, you know, if you guys are gonna study, this is what you should study. You need to know your history. And before you can go forward, you need to know what happened. Could you talk a little bit of what you remember about um, your work as an editor in um, uh, inviting people to to practice their writing through uh, through uh, their their involvement in tech news? So, what kind of an editor were you at tech news? If if, if you didn't leave my desk, you weren't considered successful. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I always considered to say, after I left my desk and went on downtown, um, and I think it's 23rd Street, that, um, that, that people print and, and received our work. Mm -hmm. Because what I was interested in was trying to assemble the people who understood writing, they were prepared to be coached and counseled to improve their writing, who needed to understand that writing was a business and that in order to generate the monies in excess of what the school had allocated, we needed to sell ads. Tech News was was not printed in, in, in Harlem. Tech News was printed down in uh, down in I think the lower west side uh, printing press lead type set borough printer b o r o printer uh -huh. so you had to get down to them in order to make sure that that the the, the type set was right that everything had lined up correctly, that you proofed it before you let it go to print. We had no idea what we were doing other than publishing the paper. But we were committed to publishing what we considered to be the, the world as, as we saw it. My question was at the end of the day, can you row this boat? And if you can row this boat, you need to stay here and let us row this boat. And if not, then, you know, and some people I asked them to leave, you know, they're wasting time, they're missing deadlines, they're writing material that was sloppy or, or not well corrected. I mean, there was some sense, <clears throat> you had to be proud of the work that you did. I was proud of the work that we did in tech news and in the paper. Our, our, our efforts were twofold. One is design in the, in the, in the, the um, issues associated with New York. And then downtown is, is where the actual printing occurred. But, but, but together, they made for a, a wonderful, wonderful paper. And I, 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 I think I was at least a decent editor. Uh, if, if, if not um, more so, mm -hmm. um, but because uh, one of the th one of the things that I did was I liked to write, mm -hmm. and I, 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 I wrote often, and I, I, I wrote it well. I was a developing poet then. Tom, I must have had a hundred, hundred and fifty poems, but the poems would catch the emotion. The poems would bind the emotion and part of what I felt then was the need to express what I wanted and transfer the feeling of my energy to the listener. 
so I think I left that era oriented towards writing for uh, clarity and brevity. So CCNY, as as I entered it, it became, um, there were two nodes. One was a science node, and one was this English node. Um, And and that's how I, uh, that's how I got through. And, and so people like and Trappé um, uh, and, and uh, Jane Kelman Murphy, um, these, these were people who worked with me to create uh, an, an, an exceptional paper and, and, and paper that, that people find to be both noteworthy for its um, its, its topics, and at the same time, um, consistent with changing the environment. I had a fellow friend named Jimmy Lazare, Jimmy Scrooge. Lazare. He was very well connected with SNCC out of Houston, Texas. He was up in New York office. And when Stokely Carmichael came back from a year with uh, Nkrumah, Stokely was greeted in an apartment in Lenox Terrace. And Jimmy was invited and Jimmy asked me to come along and I came and I took James Fleshman with me and we 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 got there and talked for probably four hours and so black power was 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 a call to to them to us and it inspired us to want to to do things like go back in the history curriculums of colleges and 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 find where black people were, you know, and find out what 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 we were doing, because the because the uh, college curriculums in the fifties and the sixties, you know, we were we made no social contribution, we made no substantive contribution, um, and this we felt this I felt fundamentally wrong, I, you know, as did thousands of others. Well, what Stokely said in the meeting was. You can't bring black power to Africa because you can't feed anybody with it. You can't close close anybody with it unless you're able to bring the technical schools, the systems, the science, the physics, the agronomy, um, medicine, nursing. Fleshman and I went back to CCNY and we started to build something called the Black Science Students Organization. And we, 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 in 69, we convened a, a, a black science students conference with mostly the seven or eight medical schools in the New York area, but there were three or 400 students. And the next year we did another conference. We had a thousand students and probably 25 African countries. One thing led to another, and we wound up with uh, federal support for the conference, I think, in 71. Yes, and Kwame Touri was here um, in our backyard. Um, we were having a, a friend of mine was having a baby shower, and they came to our house to pick up something. And they stopped and they said, is that who I think it is? Is that Stokely in your backyard? And, so uh, he now goes by the name Kwame. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I said. Uh-huh. And he and his wife were in our backyard, uh, sitting outside, just enjoying the sun on the deck.
I, I can't tell you what a, a deep and abiding and personal friend Francie is for me. Francie remains a family friend and always will be. Um, About a week ago, I, I spent time with her. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what this means is that you know, 20 or 30 or 40 years later, it doesn't matter. That, 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 that we, we see some of the work as, as work, work that never dies. Mm -hmm. How did, how did going to a commuter school, uh, how did it affect you? So getting up at 6.15 or 6 to make a 6.30 bus, to make a you know hour train ride, hour and a half train ride, to then walk up the hill and get to CCNY. I mean that was, you, you know you 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 just you, you build that into into the program. You know, I I wished we had had a a place where we could have spent more time together as a group of students. Uh, it would have I think perhaps more enriched us. I wonder if you uh, have any uh, memories of working with people like, uh, in addition to Francie Covington, people like Louis Rivera or Bob Feaster, later known as Seku Sundiara, or uh, Jane Tillman Irving, um, uh, Tom McDonald. If you remember working with any of them, uh, any, any memories you'd like to share? Um, uh, I remember all of them. Mm -hmm. Um and and and, and um, I have had the outfit to that list as well. Um, she she was a, a wonderful friend and a mentor. Mm -hmm. Um, Jane Tillman Irving was also an, an important part of the puzzle. Um. As, as, uh, as were Louis Rivera, mm -hmm. who, who, who came after me, but who continued to follow up on, on the legacy. It, 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 it's, it's like Black and Hispanic, mm -hmm. but, but they, are, they are all one. Mm. Can yes. You, do you want to do you want to tell us about how, how what it was like meeting Louie and working with Louie? Um, it, it, it was it was like a, a gift that was into coming to its own. The, the, the whole idea of black people and brown people working together take on a, a special, unique significance particularly when a whole, a whole lot of people in the community didn't give what people like Louis Rivera is giving to the folks and 38th and 138th in Casa Labra. Mm -hmm. I think I was in the Tech News newspaper. He walked in one day and he said, uh, you guys are doing good work. I want to. I want to. I want to work with you. And he was that direct and that blunt. And Louis Rivera could could construct a, uh, images that would become alive, but it was without doubt a um, stunningly positive insertion of new energy into the team. And it was also obvious to me that he had the leadership skills to lead the team when I left. Black and brown mm -hmm. are one. And that's all I need to say about that. Okay. 
I hear that. And there's volumes in that. Mm -hmm. We were people who believed in change. We felt that it was our responsibility to change. And if not, those of us who do change, there's nobody who will come behind to make the change. And, 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 and so, um, we did the change because nobody else was able to make the change. So in, in 69, you are now uh, an editor? Yes. Of the Was it managing editor? editor? Uh, managing editor and sometimes an issue editor too. Mm -hmm. um, so were you involved in the, uh, the five demands protest? I was actively involved, but more as a as a as a writer than as a uh, protester. Although. I mean, being where I was in tech news, people learned over the years to, to trust what I wrote. And so I had access. And, and, I, and I used that access to try to tell the truth. What kind of advice would you give to student journalists who are working at the paper now at City College? Uh, and uh, to uh, journalists in general who are uh, hoping to uh, make these changes or start conversations or to challenge uh, the kinds of um, uh, systems of power that, that don't benefit people? The most important thing is, is to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. the, the, the one, once you're able to do that, truth, doesn't lie and doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. and, and people who are responsible for truth, ultimately, they live forever. So the, the other thing that I, I think is, is essential mm -hmm. is, is that um, the, the, the past goes forward. And, and for those who can can see the future, like like in the past, we only do what we can do while we are here. And so, while I am here, um, know that my work continues, and and, and it never dies. Mm -hmm. So Denise, I'm curious to know, you know, the, tell us the love story of you and Paul. Ah, well, we met in a grocery store the first time. Oh. Um, he had some good friends here who, uh, after we met the first time, they said, come back out for his birthday and come visit. Mm -hmm. And I said, and I can't fly from DC to San Diego on a whim and they said there'll be a ticket at the airport for you <laughs> and i went to the airport and there was my ticket so back Beautiful. to san diego i came the second time i came to california we spent the week together and we just talked about all of that what was important to us mm -hmm. you know family um needing to educate people on what their rights and responsibilities were needing to make sure that the that we dealt with systems paul is better with systems, I work better with individuals. Mm -hmm. So between the two of us, his New York attitude and my DC world attitude. <laughs> eh. And sometimes people said to us, you're not from here, are you? <laughs> and we would say, no, I'm from DC, he's from New York. And they said, yeah, we can tell. And, and I actually went to work and um, did finish my master's in public health here mm -hmm. and um, 
then we got married, had a set of twins and another follow-up. When we first moved here, we lived in by the beach. You know, okay. you move to San Diego, you want to live by the beach. Well, there you go. There are not a lot of black people who lived by the beach at that mm. particular point in time. And I would go to the, they don't have any enclosed malls here when I moved, they were all outdoor malls. And I would say to Paul, I saw another black couple at the mall and I spoke to them and some people would respond and others would act like, why are you talking to me? I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, I was so excited to, to and then when I began to work in community, actually Paul helped, he was working at the health department by that time and they actually built a comprehensive health center in Southeastern San Diego. And I began to work there. And um, that's when we began to see the community as a whole. There were more black people, there were more Latinx folks, there were more Samoans and Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. You got the full breadth of what San Diego was about, but you don't see that at the beach. Mm -hmm. Our physician is a friend of ours. He and Paul were at UCSD together. Oh, and he wow. was reminding Paul about when they had to bring Angela Davis out to speak at UCSD because they were in a genetics class and they were talking about Jensen and who was the other guy? Munsinger. And Munsinger in, in uh, uh, different genetic theorists and how, uh, I won't mention his name, but how the physician said, yeah, we had to bring Angela out here and her brother out here. And, and they spoke to the class and they wound up getting an apology from the chancellor of UCSD about what was being taught um, to medical students. Wow. Paul was very highly respected and people appreciated all the work that he had put into helping um, have this center built in the community. It was the first one built from the ground up specifically to serve the people. It wasn't a storefront and it wasn't a converted warehouse. They built a brand new spanking center to serve the people of Southeast San Diego. Um, we had a black, two black newspapers at that point that were mm. functional. Um, and so the, it was, Paul wrote for the paper, can I give him your, um, he wrote for the Voice and Viewpoint, uh, but he didn't write under his own name because he was a county employee. So okay. he wrote under, um, a pseudonym, H. Gersom Jones. And there we so, go. so he used to write for the Voice and Viewpoint different articles, but not under his own name. Um, and I love that, that, yeah. that factoid right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He kept writing. He hadn't there stopped writing. But, and, you know, it's interesting being Paul's wife came with a lot of um, insight into the larger picture, but also um, people knew who he was and knew what his mindset was about healthcare and healthcare for all. And his, one of his famous sayings was, I want to make this facility so that if my grandmother needed to be here, it would be a safe and comfortable place for her. Mm -hmm. and, That's beautiful. Yeah. So I always thought, that my work was always gonna be making sure that we had the same services and the same opportunities as anybody else. There was no reason not to. Uh, we went to a lot of meetings. We went to community meetings to start new community health centers, um, um, getting family planning services out into community and just, trying to make sure that people got a fair shake. And so it's still a healthcare desert to some um, extent, but um, there are more uh, community clinics now and there are more private offices, but it wasn't like that in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. There were a few black docs who came here and opened up a great facility um, on Euclid. And it was probably what, 20 of them. Mm -hmm. um, and they had all come from different places for the most part, and they opened up a facility here. Um, and we tried to support all the work, and they supported all the work that we did. 
I eventually became the, um, I was a health educator and I eventually became the executive director for the California Black Health Network. Like what were some of your inspirations for working on healthcare um, as, as you came into these fields? Well, I, well, let me say that for 20 plus years, the black docs and the black health workers got together every year and held an annual conference up and down mm -hmm. the state. We met in Oakland, we met in San Francisco, we met in Los Angeles and San Diego. Um, and from there, when HIV first became an issue, we had speakers come from all over the country, from Howard and from New York, to talk to the docs and the health workers, because we had, in CBHN, we had hospital administrators, nurses, docs. Um, the Black nurses here also worked with us. And so the three groups would get together annually to talk about issues in community. Wow. Um, the the um, Asian um, Nurses Association met with us. The Latino no Nurses Association met with us. So we crossed lines because it was all about people of color. Mm -hmm. And here in California, depending on where you live, you can hear probably four or five different languages on any given day. Um, so we knew this had to be a people of color effort. It was uh, working with the National Medical Association. Paul continued to work with them over the years and was involved in trying to develop that first plan with the Clinton administration um, with the black doctors. Um, and it was okay for me because we spent a lot of time going back and forth to Washington DC, which is my <laughs> home. So that was like the extra added plus. I belong to the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. We used to get funding from the state of California to work in tobacco issues, to get people to stop smoking, um, to get people to be aware of the harm of menthol cigarettes and, and recently of vaping. Well, the state decided they didn't want to fund ethnic groups anymore. So in 2008, we just decided we'd do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, we came together and formed the African American Tobacco Coalition. Um, the Asian Pacific Islander group became Appeal. Um, so uh, while we continued to work individually as groups, we also came together to work on the issue around tobacco uh, multi-ethnically. Um, and so we worked on Medicare and Medi-Cal issues, particularly here in California, it's called Medi-Cal. So we used to work on Medi-Cal issues a lot. Okay. Um, but it was all about improving people's health care. It's not hit it and miss or hit it and quit. It's a constant, it's a every day. Um, you have to not necessarily work at it, but be aware of how you're perceived, be aware of what you need to do to, to just better. Um, the world as a whole, you know. Mm -hmm. um, um, Paul is human. I, I like to say that people are human, H-U-E, a man, a man of color. But it's been a good life. Thank mm -hmm. you, Paul. Mm -hmm.